then I start. I take every minute I can get. I try to be really quick, but I also want to give you a deep dive. So that might get a bit intense. Um, we can talk afterwards if it was too quick. So I'm Oliver, I'm working at HERE, I'm Director for Interactive Data at HERE, um, and we're happy to be at FOS4G again. We've been in San Diego when we launched XYZ. And I wanted to tell you a bit more about um, what XYZ is, but first of all, let me quickly give you an update for those of you who haven't heard about HERE. Um, we are a company which is primarily building map data for industrial processes, so essentially doing sensor data, uh, having cars out there in 200 countries driving around and updating the map. Um, more recently, we have been bought by car manufacturers and they have been very supportive of our journey where we wanted to say, we want to become more open source, we want to become more involved in the community. So our open source journey started 2015, um, primarily around open source tools because one of the big problems that a co big company has is making sure that we honor all the licenses that are in the various libraries that we're pulling into our tools. So we build that tool set with a couple of partners like Microsoft and Amazon and others. Um, we are very active with the open source review toolkit, but also with standardizations like SPDX. It's not geo-related at all, but for open source, it's extremely relevant. As of probably two months ago, I'm also on the technical advisory committee for the Urban Computing Foundation, which is um, a Linux foundation offshoot focusing on smart cities essentially and a stack and an infrastructure and open source projects, um, supporting open source projects around urban computing. It's just getting started. If you think there's a project that you would want to bring under that umbrella as well, um, talk to me or go to the Open Computing Foundation website to learn more. Now to XYZ, what we're <coughs> here to talk about essentially is if I take a look at the state of the web maps today, it's still a bit like, okay, it's mostly read only. You can see maps on the web. There are a few creators of web maps, mostly professionals, probably mostly also from a group that has been educated in GIS, geoinformatics, and who really know the tools that they are using. Um, and it's mostly static. I mean, it's data that you prepare at one point, you work a lot with the data, and then you publish it, you bring it on the web, you share it with people. Um, if I take a step back personally, then it looks to me like it was, it, it looks like the web at 1995, where the web pages were mainly static. There were a big, couple of big contributors to the web, but it's not as interactive as we know it today. Yes, and we got vectors and emojis, but that is not really making up for a lot. So a lot of technology and innovation has happened on the web blogs, chat, Flickr, so we are expecting much more interactivity, much more real-time turnaround of what's going on. And a couple of guys in here thought about, can we uh, play the mad scientist and actually think about, can we turn read-only maps in really read-write maps where you can collaborate, where you can work together without having to install a lot of complex tooling that I, I like to talk about normal users and the professional GIS users because normal users already struggle with tools like um, Office 365 or something that is on the web that is actually very easy if you are uh, a technology person that offer collaboration, but we haven't seen that really in the space of mapping and GIS tools. And that has also been a big stumbling block in the company internally. So uh, you can't imagine how often we think um, in our company, we have a cool data set, I want to show it to somebody. What do I need to do to show it to somebody? Because that might be a manager who doesn't have QGIS installed, so how do I get a map that conveys the message that I want to convey to these people? Um, so we thought, it's, th there's nothing really out there that fitted the bill. There were a lot of um, components, language uh, barriers between Python and JavaScript and uh, GDAL and all the stuff somehow gets in the mix, but we thought, can't we just somehow bundle that up together and make it easier to use? And that's really where XYZ came from. So it's, think about it as a content management system, a blogging system for map data on a very high level. It goes much deeper and I'm going to show you that it's not only that, but we wanted to provide that entry point. So we are essentially switching from 
words that we're publishing on a blog to coordinates that we're putting on the map, but still want to edit. You want to have a similar moderation edit cycle where you can go in and update maps without having to republish them and send your, uh, your audience a new link. People should be able to go to a map and see the most recent information that you want to show them, possibly even go back in time. And to make that happen, all these components somehow need to play together and it all hinges around APIs. And I'm going, to bit, uh, going a bit into the APIs and depending on how quickly I talk, we can do a quick demo at the end to actually show you how that really looks like. One thing that we wanted to do, as I said, is from the engineering team, we wanted to make it open. Um, it's difficult in a large company that has been business focused to go out and say, we need to take the stuff that we are building and share it with the community. Um, it took a lot of convincing, but people were open to that because we are also using a lot of open source internally and we felt we need to give back and take what we have and bring it in front of the community and say, is that something that helps everybody? Can we drive this forward? The other thing that we wanted to do is not recreate something that already has a good presence in the community. So we don't want to compete with QGIS or we don't want to compete with GDAL because there are very good solutions already out there. Why should we rebuild them? What we wanted to ensure is really interoperability that you can take any tool and plug our functionality into your um, kind of, kind of work working day, how you're working. We didn't want to change the way you're working. We just want to make it easier. And that means also open standards, open data. How do we exchange data, which is if I have to pick one problem that I see all the time, it's access to data is still way too difficult. There are too many formats out there. There are different discovery mechanisms. And then you're spending a lot of time converting the data into the right projection, into the right format, wherever, whatever you need, whatever you want to show. And finally, we said, well, if we are going to do that, let's take a step back and try to build it so that it becomes a real-time system so that we can change data immediately both on the client side that can be a web browser or a mobile device and push that change to the server and everybody who looks at that map sees exactly that update. That turnaround cycle becomes really powerful um, and it's not something that is easily done. You can do it um, but there's a lot of infrastructure involved and not everybody wants to get into the business of managing infrastructure. So this is a bit the, the reasoning behind it. And now I need to talk about this guy and it's not about Postgres, it's um, about the elephant in the room because I'm talking about open source. I want to get that out of the door. The plan is for complete XYZ, including um, the Hub Studio Viewer JS Maps, so a Maps implementation that we have, to be on GitHub by the end of the year. The, work, the team is working tirelessly on that, but we have to go through our open source review process so that we can make sure that we are honoring all the licenses. It's not as easy as an individual uh, developer pushing out a project onto GitHub. It's more complicated for a company. We already have the QGIS plugin integration on GitHub, which we can talk about a bit more if you're interested on the booth. Um, we have a CLI and the documentation is already out there. So that's the current state and from a very high level, XYZ Studio is really a simple web application where you can go in and edit and maintain your maps. It's really geared towards users who've never installed um, ArcGIS or QGIS and who don't know how to work with that. A simple website that you log on to and manipulate data or bring data in that you want to work with. And it follows at the moment the complete flow from acquiring data, manipulating data, and then a very final easy step to hit a publish button and you get a link or an iframe code snippet that you can take and copy and paste onto your blog or onto Twitter. And we're adding more and more publishing capability and more and more um, ways of bringing data in. At the moment, it's very much focused on GeoJSON because we see it especially for users and also developers when I'm talking about the APIs who have never ever experienced anything like WFS who might look on their Android device at an API and say, I'm getting, I'm getting three integers back or three floating, floating point numbers back. They tell me it's 
uh, latitude, longitude, and altitude, what I'm going to do about this if I want to track my location? How do I do that? Um, so essentially, we wanted to bridge that gap from web and application developers to into the GIS world. They are not um, GIS experts at the moment. But really more powerful behind the scenes is actually when you are moving out of, the, out of the world of studio, which is a very easy entry point into custom APIs and bringing data on top of uh, a map, a web map that is interactive, that you can click on and interact with. I wouldn't say this is something that we've never seen before. We certainly all know that this kind of interactivity exists, but rarely is it connected to a data source that is also live, where the data feeds might be coming from different uh, devices, maybe from sensor data that is being collected in the field right away and immediately published into that data store. And that's where really the power comes from. That means you need to do, to do a bit more coding, um, but it's very easy essentially because you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. And I don't know about you, if you're building um, geospatial solutions, you probably most of the time don't want to worry about infrastructure and keeping Postgres running and installing all the security patches and making sure uh, GDPR is a big thing. Um, if we're hosting it in the cloud, if you have customer data in there, this is all stuff that you normally need to worry about. And we said, is that something that we as a big company can take out of the equation? And if somebody wants to do that, it's great. You can take the stack, you can install it, you can run it on your own, but then you are also maintaining the server and maintaining all these security perimeters if you need to. If you don't want to do that, um, we have a freemium offer that is very easy to use. You don't need a credit card. There is no lock-in. You can take your data out if you want to. And uh, you can use it already for commercial purposes. And you're getting access to here APIs that we have, like geocoding and routing. Um, so it's really, we want to make it easy for people to try it out and to say, this is something that, that helps to bring to solve my problem. That is where we try to focus on. And digging one level deeper here is how do I talk to these back-end storages? How do I talk to that? And we try to abstract away everything that is very specific for, for geospatial stuff and try to make it generic and really simple from an API perspective. Just a couple of calls and developers might know the CRUD paradigm, create, update, delete. Um, this is essentially what we are using, it's a simple REST API, so it's a protocol that, um, the HTTP protocol that the web talks anyway. And then it's as simple as posting is a little snippet describing, I want to create a new space as a post request to our service. And what you get essentially is a database provisioned for you or a database table essentially provisioned for you where you can store your data. And that takes milliseconds. So you can just stand up your data immediately. Um, and I probably need to say a word about spaces. Spaces, we deliberately didn't choose the term layers because it's so overloaded in that space already. Um, spaces, what we wanted to say is, let's make sure that it's very easy to use. So for our spaces, it, they, they live with GeoJSON data. So that means you can take points, lines, polygons, multi-polygons, and put them in a space. And Normally, if you do that with QGIS or with other tools, you need to have different layer for these different types. And we said normal web developers wouldn't care about it. Why can't I put a polygon and a point into the same uh, content database? They might have different attribution. That is something that we have to deal with. So spaces are essentially global worldwide layers where you don't have to worry about what data you are storing in that or how much data you put in that. We are using that functionality internally. We are currently managing about nine terabyte of live active data that continuously runs in that system, which is essentially our road database, points, POIs, um, building outlines, all the stuff that we're getting. And once you have a space, the next thing is you can get content into that. We give you some lightweight tools like a CLI or the, the studio where you can just take a file and upload it. If you want to do that yourself, you're just posting a snippet of GeoJSON into the service and we make sure it shows up at the right position. We also make sure that we can give you dynamic tiling on the fly. So you can request, you can just push in GeoJSON and you can ask for tiles. You would get tiles back. And we can even um, sort of surgically update individual points, individual features, where you're saying, I don't know that complete structure, but I know 
the name of this football stadium has changed from Anfield to something else and you're just posting that update and we are making sure that we can merge all that stuff into the database. And eventually, of course, there's a call to get it out again, either by ID, which is a different discussion, how IDs get created, um, but you can also ask for it by bounding box, give me everything that is in this bounding box or everything that is in this bounding box that has a certain um, property or has a value greater than or less than anything. So the usual kind of interaction requests. And it becomes more interesting in the next level when um, obviously this is very helpful for low zoom, deep zoom levels when you're deeply zoomed in and you want to see the details. Once you're zooming out, you want to get um, a, a higher level overview like a heat map or something. Um, we are supporting hex bins on the CLI. You can essentially take your content and say, generate an overview of that content so that I can quickly zoom around and work with that. Um, that is a big focus area at the moment. So deep dive, what's behind it? First of all, for developers, it's one API. Um, out of necessity, we had a lot of legacy systems that were talking very different APIs depending on which uh, layer in time they were created. Some were talking uh, SQL, others were uh, like uh, XML requests and all of that. And every developer had to, had to learn a new interaction paradigm depending on what data he wanted to work with. We said, let's encapsulate all of that, put one API in front, treat everything that is stored in the database the same, and then it doesn't really matter where you get your data from, you just talk to a space, and that space might contain building outlines or it might contain a GPS trace or some live positions, but the mechanics is always the same. And you can share spaces. You, by definition or by, by default, when you're going in, your spaces are private. Nobody can look into that. We can't look, can't look into that. You need to explicitly share that. Uh, if you're publishing to the world, obviously we need to be able to show it to the world, so we need to be able to read your space. But we also have a very fine grain, granular um, permission system behind it where you can say, I want to allow contributions in my space, but I don't want to allow deletes on my space. Or maybe somebody is only allowed to change objects, but not create new objects. All of these mechan mechanisms work. And if you know a bit about a structure, how computer operating system works, you probably eventually see a pattern there that it looks very much like a Linux system, especially if we're going to the next view, because behind that API are hidden different mechanisms of accessing the data. So on a computer, to take that paradigm, you have different device drivers uh, that allow you to talk to uh, a USB stick, a network drive, a CD drive, a DVD drive, but as a user, you don't care really how the mechanics work of working with that system. You just want to get your files from there. And we're doing the same thing with geodata. So when you create a new space, it lands in our XYZ cloud if you want to. But there's also a way through these connectors to hook up different sources of data. So you could say, I have a live API from another system that isn't even geospatial, maybe where I need to do some processing or I have an existing WFS service, and you can hook up a connector that does that bit of conversion that is involved for our system to talk to another system. That also allows us to connect securely other databases. If you say, we don't, I don't want to give you my data because I want to keep that private, but I still want to work with your system, maybe I don't want to completely host it myself, then we can build a connector and hook it into the system saying, this connector does a conversion from your private database into the language that we need to communicate to request and update data. And this can be as easy, as complex um, as you want to. Most of the time you're just reading data, updating data becomes more interesting. But it's a good way to migrate away from legacy systems as well, so you can easily abstract that out. Behind that, just uh, five seconds on that, uh, architecture view, we have essentially hooked up a UI, the front end side of a JavaScript maps component to the back end so that it knows quite a lot about the back end so that you then don't have to work about how do I read data from the back end and push it onto the map and when I'm panning and zooming and scrolling, something needs to be pushed off the map and reloaded. 
all of these mechanics are baked into the API already. You just say, I want to see a map, and it should have satellite imagery and my space on top of that, or multiple spaces on top of that. In addition, it has a rich component model behind it, so we are firing events both on the client and on the server. And the server is obviously a bit more complex, that's why it's also taking us a bit more time to open source it, because it does not only deliver your data, you can also get map tile data, MVT data for both here and for the first time. For here, also OSM data through the um, MapZen project, the TileZen project. Um, we are collaborating with them. Actually, we, I have a couple of MapZen folks on my team, and it's been extremely fruitful. But it goes much deeper. Essentially, that's the high-level architecture that makes that happen. Um, but it goes conceptually even a couple of steps deeper where you don't only store your data. You can logically manipulate your data. You can build up what we are calling virtual spaces, which essentially are combinations of different sources where depending on how you configure these virtual spaces, something might overlap or overwrite something that exists in an underlying space. And this allows us to build, for example, the rich editing capabilities that we have in Map Creator, which is the source for all of that goodness in the API because we built that eight years ago and battle tested it essentially in the most complex use case we could find in our company. Uh, you can combine layers together so that you don't have to make five requests to get five layers. We're just merging them on the fly. And it even goes so far, it's not publicly live yet, um, that you can hook up into events on the server side. So you could, for example, every time, no matter through which client your data changes, you can trigger an event on the server side, push it in a message queue, and do some custom processing on it. So it's a very powerful and rich communication mechanism to do that. And since I'm probably hitting almost out of time, we can do two things at once. One is a demo, and at the same time, while we're doing the demo, we can uh, have questions, and you can watch what's happening on the screen. So let's quickly see that in action. If you have a mobile phone and hopefully a bit of connection, scan that QR code or enter the bit.ly code. And I'm going to do the same thing here on the device. Hopefully, it pops up on the right uh, screen on the web browser. And let me click that, and hopefully something opens. And here we are. Uh, I still missed my mouse pointer. Eventually, it will pop up on the screen. I don't know if it's left, left, right, or oops. So what we have here is a map that essentially says, as a background, I want to have OSM data as vector tiles. It might be here data. I'm not quite sure looking at that. It could be one of those. And if you are seeing the same thing on your phone, you can just tap on that and uh, a point shows up. Not very exciting at the moment. Um, but let me zoom out a bit. How do I do that? Yeah. Now a mouse would be good. These are just points on the map, but behind that it is, you can look at the web page and it's really super, super basic. Um, we're pushing the tabs that you're making into the space and everybody else sees the same thing that is happening in this space. Um, and even more, we have with the QGIS plugin, for example, the capability to hook up that space. Oh, perfect. Uh, is there one space left? Oh, that is super. Oh, thank you. Uh, let me just control zero. Mm. 
And now, I mean, you can tap on the location where you came from. If you're zooming out, pinch zoom on the phone. Oh, and now it wants to install Logitech software. We don't want that. Um, so this is uh, a very simple demo, but it shows also it's very easy to develop a solution that works locally, but sometimes it, it, it just works well. People want to use it worldwide, and suddenly you're running into an infrastructure thing where you're saying, oh, how do I scale that up so that it does work in, in Europe, in the US, in Asia? How does it work uh, partly offline if the client is not connected, for example? Um, let me go to the world map. I'm sorry, we are too busy putting dogs on the map. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. <laughs> so no questions. It's actually, uh, pretty effective, right? <laughs> it's actually pretty fun, and we try to capture that and make a video out of it. Questions? Um, in the next version, we will, yes, yeah, that you can proxy raster data through actually any binary data. Um, so essentially what we want to capture is, yes, you want to have satellite imagery in the background. Um, there are other use cases where you want to have height fields or 3D models that are very specific that you can proxy through that system and still have the same mechanism of working with that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I can repeat the questions if you don't want to pass it through. So, uh, no, look, super impressive. Regarding the open source versus commercial part, like, uh, I understand that you are moving toward open source. Yeah. Is it also something that make uh, import, export possible? Like, vendor locking is not only about the license, it's also about, like, how easy it is to move to and out it eventually? Exactly. So, yeah. do, do you have plans for that? Is it something? It's already there, so you can immediately, there, there is in Studio already a download button where you can get all the data that you put in Studio. You can use the API to pull it out, or the CLI where you're just saying, dump my space into a file and you get all the GeoJSON data. Um, we are also thinking about it to make read-only copies of the PostGIS database that we're using available, so essentially a replica where we're saying if somebody wants to use PostGIS functions directly, uh, why should we not give you access to do that or at least a way to replicate from our Postgres into your system? Because essentially it's GeoJSON data. Yes, we want to make that really easy. <laughs> Go ahead, more questions. Uh, uh, is this like some kind of side marketing project or if no, what's your way to get money if you decide to open source all of that, that stuff? Um, one way is to get a bit more recognition in the community because last year when we talked to people they were like here what you are doing what um, now we are getting a bit more known but it's also the business model behind it is that um, the hosted version is free up to five gigabyte of data which is already a lot of data and two and a half gigabyte of transfer and especially for the commercial use cases we see if people are putting in a lot of data and use the system and are successful we are saying okay we want to get a share for that and it's primarily uh, what we find already the customers who have existing systems who are willing to switch over and say it is much cheaper to pay the fee than to run the complete infrastructure ourselves but we want to keep it extremely open actually from the engineering team we've been trying to push and say can we do it completely open and no limits for open source projects which is also um, kind of a pattern we see often in open source projects but they were saying essentially we need to cap it at one point because otherwise it would not be commercially uh, planable it's not I'm not saying it's not viable. It was not a loaded question. I mean, you need a sustainable model as the software will not... Exactly, exactly. We want, to, we want to develop it further and also once we go on GitHub um, end of this year, we want to work more with the community to actually find out what are good use cases, what are your problems, can we solve that by using that infrastructure and particularly for me, I try to work with the Urban Computing Foundation to say is that something um, that we can put under the governance model of the Urban Computing Foundation out of the control of here and get more partners on board and get more um, uh, collaboration on that level. Good, and we're almost over time, and you're ready to go. Thank you. Thank you.